A 90-year-old woman with a history of end-stage renal disease presents to the emergency department after a fall. She has a badly comminuted humerus fracture and is admitted to the hospital overnight for rehab placement. Despite re receiving 10 milligrams of oxycodone, she continues to complain of pain. The emergency physician orders one milligram of intravenous hydromorphone for pain. The hospital orders an additional one milligram intravenously an hour later. 30 minutes after that, she's found unarousable with pinpoint pupils and agonal breathing. What happened? Iatrogenic opioid analgesic overdose is potentially lethal, but generally preventable. In-hospital opioid overdose frequently occurs as a result of errors in drug administration and ordering. The concomitant use of sedative hypnotics, such as benzodiazepines, is associated with an increased risk of death in opioid overdose. The classic toxidrome of depressed mental status, or coma, respiratory depression, and meiosis suggests the diagnosis of opioid toxicity. The hallmark of opioid intoxication is respiratory depression, less than 12 breaths per minute in adults, hypoxia, or hypercarbia. Even in the therapeutic dosing, opioids cause a dose-dependent decline in all phases of respiration. At the bedside, the most easily recognizable finding is a slowing of respiratory rate leading to apnea. Outside of sleep, a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute or less in an adult strongly suggests opioid intoxication, particularly when accompanied by somnolence and meiosis. In a stable patient, the bedside providers can review the chart for an opioid exposure and additionally question the patient about home medications brought into the hospital or illicit drug use, like heroin, which may continue in the hospital setting. The physical examination should include mental status, size and reactivity of the pupils, respiratory rate and effort, and findings consistent with pulmonary edema on auscultation. The patient should be completely undressed to examine for the presence of track marks or fentanyl patches. For patients with an unknown or potentially prolonged downtime, muscle groups should be examined for signs of compartment syndrome. Managing an opioid overdose in patients with evidence of respiratory depression requires a series of maneuvers to restore oxygenation and ventilation while reversing the opioid effect with naloxone, an opioid antagonist. First, provide ventilation. Use a bag valve mask for patients with stupor who have respiratory rates of 12 breaths per minute or less. Occasionally, patients will be found with foam around their mouth or nose due to opioid-associated pulmonary edema. Second, position the jaw. Chin lift and jaw thrust maneuvers should also be performed to ensure that anatomical positioning helps decrease hypercarbia. Third, administer naloxone. Naloxone is a competitive mu opioid receptor antagonist that reverses all signs of opioid intoxication. It's essential to note that the reversal of opioid analgesic toxicity after administering single doses of naloxone is often brief. When naloxone is administered intravenously, the onset of action is less than two minutes and the duration of action is between 20 to 90 minutes. Ideally, naloxone should be given at the lowest possible dose to stimulate respiration and reverse altered mental status. Higher doses may precipitate severe opioid withdrawal. In adults, a starting dose of 0.4 milligrams of naloxone can be administered IV with intranasal or intramuscular routes used if no access can be obtained. If no response occurs, readministration should occur sequentially with increasing doses of 0.5, 2, 4, and 10 milligrams every two to three minutes. Naloxone can be administered without reservation in patients with evidence of respiratory depression, knowing that symptomatic treatment of opioid withdrawal is preferable to life-threatening hypoxia or hypercarbia. If recurrent respiratory depression occurs, a continuous naloxone infusion or oral tracheal intubation may be ind indicated. Remember that administering naloxone does not immediately reverse existing hypercarbia. Finally, check for fentanyl patches. Once the patient's condition is stable, you should search their skin and mucous membranes for patches even when fentanyl abuse is not uh, suspected. Remove any patches, then decontaminate the skin with soap and cool water. Depending on the opioid's duration of action, the naloxone effect may wear off before the opioid effect. The risk of recurrent respiratory depression is highest in patients who have been exposed to high-dose opioids, long-acting preparations, 
and in the pediatric population. Inappropriately short periods of observation have been associated with death. Even patients who receive low-dose naloxone may develop recurrent life-threatening apnea. Following administration of naloxone, aggressive monitoring and frequent reevaluations are necessary. Often, these patients will require transfer to a higher level of care. The downstream complications of the atriogenic opioid overdose are typically related to hypoxia and include shock liver, ARDS, acute tubular necrosis, and anoxic brain injury. Severe hypercarbia may necessitate endotracheal intubation. We do not recommend non-invasive ventilatory strategies for hypercarbia in the atriogenic opioid overdose patients who require naloxone due to somnolence and risk of vomiting. Pulmonary edema can occur in patients and become clinically apparent after reversal with naloxone, the mechanism of which is unclear. Any questions regarding the length of observation for specific cases should be referred to a poison control center or medical toxicologist. Share these videos with your team about how to recognize an opioid overdose and the pitfalls of treating a patient after opioid overdose.